All right, so let's get started. Hello and welcome to this presentation on Qt Quick Best Practices and Design Patterns. Uh, my name is Girish. Uh, I'm an ex-troll. Uh, I used to work at Trolltech at the Oslo office. I have worked on many things, including Qt Style Sheets, Qt Completer. I also was um, responsible for the initial code behind widgets on the canvas, graphics view layouts. I was also the release manager for Qt 4.2 and 4.3 series. Uh, I left Trolltech uh, in 2007 and started my own company uh, called Forward BS Technologies, which is a Qt consulting company back in Bangalore. Uh, these days, I'm a contributor to the WebKit project and Caligra and Qt Media Hub. Uh, if you have any questions related to Qt WebKit, uh, feel free to grab me after this talk. So I started studying QML about um, a year back. I was looking into all the small examples and demos. Uh, it was fairly nice, nice effects and transitions. Uh, I thought I should really try to see how QML scales to larger applications, see how it performs. So along with two Nokia employees, Johannes and Donald, I started a project called Qt Media Hub. It is an open source project, uh, which is essentially a clone of XBMC. If you don't know XBMC, it is essentially a media center in which you can browse your videos, movies, and pictures. This talk is essentially all the things which I learned when developing Qt Media Hub. Uh, one of the lessons which I learned is that QML is very easy to write, but it's hard to read. And this happens because a lot of us are very new to QML. Um, all of us bring our own ideas on what exactly declarative is and uh, how the code should be structured and how different things should be done. So when you read another person's code, it's just really hard to understand. So this is my agenda for today. I want to explain what is the best way uh, to design QML applications. Uh, I'm also going to give out some tricks uh, which you can use in QML. Uh, this is actually an advanced talk, and I sort of have an implicit thing that you already know QML. So I'm going to ask how many of you here know QML and have worked with QML? Can you please raise your hands? Ah, OK. So that's like around 80, 90%. I see we have a small crowd here. So if you have any questions uh, in the middle, just feel free to stop me, and we can just cover it easily. We are less than 100 people here. So as we know, QML is a JavaScript-based declarative language. Uh, you have bindings um, and property assignments, which are really simple to do. If you look into all the standard elements that come as a part of QML, uh, most of them are simple graphical elements, like rectangles, images, list views, um, very simple stuff. As soon as you start developing a larger scale application, you will notice that you have to pretty much have a way of extending QML. And thankfully, QML has a way of extending uh, using C++. You can register custom C++ types, uh, and you can also register existing objects to extend through QML. I'll go into a little more detail about these a bit later. The most important thing which you will face when you start your project is how much exactly should we do in QML, how much in JavaScript, and how much in C++. In Qt Media Hub, when we started to develop, um, we were new to QML and JavaScript. And our approach was essentially do everything in JavaScript, do everything in QML, keep the C++ code to a minimum. And that was our philosophy. We basically hit two bottlenecks uh, with this approach. The first problem we had was that we had a lot of intensive JavaScript. And on all the embedded targets, this was quite slow. And the startup time was quite slow with QML. And the second problem we had was we had a lot of business logic uh, in the JavaScript. Um, in QML, if, if you remember the initial slides of Qt Media Hub, I had two different user interfaces. Let's see here. So we have two completely different user interfaces. So these are what we call as skins, right? When we started working on the second skin, we found that we were copying code uh, from the first skin. It's the exact same code. And we were wondering, you know what, let's try to share the JavaScript um, 
across these skins. And that didn't work well too, because these are really third-party skins. So the first concept I'm going to introduce you guys to is the model view pattern. Uh, I want you to think of the C++ as the runtime. Uh, the C++ is a provider of services. It just exposes data. The C++ side is the model. The QML side is the presentation layer. Uh, it shows the UI. It has the, all the Blink stuff. It takes user input. It is also the controller. In, and it feeds the user actions into the C++ runtime. The most important thing is that there is a one-way traffic. QML depends on C++ and not the other way around. If you ever find yourself writing code in C++ which accesses QML stuff, you are doing it wrong. You should not access UI stuff, QML stuff from C++. I believe when you code UIs this way, you are coding to QML strength. QML's main strength is to have multiple, is to make graphical user interfaces really simple to write. Uh, using this approach where you have all the data, all the backend stuff in the C++, you can write multiple user interfaces um, running on the same runtime. So I'm just going to reiterate uh, what I said. Don't ever access QML user interface stuff from C++. Um, QML has C++ classes like QDeclarative Expression, QDeclarative Script String, which help you manipulate and find, ob find QML objects from C++. Don't use them. The only reason you should ever use them is for UI testing and automation. One nice thing about the backend approach is, of course, you can think of user interfaces um, even without QML. You can possibly have a QWidget-based front-end or a HTML-based front-end. There are two ways in QML. There are two ways QML allows you to extend it uh, through C++. Uh, the first way is by registering a type. Uh, so here we have a type C++ type called my button. Uh, we just register the type to QML using QML register type my button. And in the QML, you can instantiate uh, this new C++ class. And you can create how many ever my buttons you want in the QML. The second way is by registering an existing C++ object. So let's assume that you have a C++ object called person. You can inject it into the QML side by using the C++ code snippet there. It's essentially you get the context, and you set the context property. right? And in the QML, you can access the properties of person using property.name, for example. My suggestion here is that you should never use context properties. You should always register types as much as possible. You should use QML register type as much as possible. Uh, to put this in perspective, in Qt Media Hub, uh, we have lots of models. We have, for example, the picture model, which has the list of all pictures uh, in your disk. As we decided, the QML side is the UI. C++ side is the backend. C++ does not know what is happening in the UI world, which means that C++ has no clue whether it is showing the picture window or not. Is picture-related information being shown on the screen? C++ has no idea. So you should let the instantiation of all the models, all types, to the UI. The UI decides when to create this model. The UI decides when to delete this model. The only reason I know of that you should be using context properties uh, is when you have C++ singletons, uh, where you have objects which never die, which, uh, have the, which are alive throughout the C++ application lifetime. Extending, or rather, exporting a type, exporting a C++ type to QML is fairly simple. You just make it a Q object. Uh, you mark your properties using Q property. Uh, you can use a signals and slots, which you can connect through in QML. Uh, you also can mark a function, any C++ function, as Q invocable, 
and the QML can access uh, this function from here on. Slots and queue invocable seem very similar. What is the difference? Uh, it is more of a semantic difference. Queue invocable is something which you call and you have a value returned. A slot is something which you connect to. So if you think of a function, let's say, like refresh, it is like a slot. You can have a timer running, and the timer slot is refresh. A queue invocable is a method, let's say, like um, give me the row count uh, for all items having a certain substring. It is not something you would connect to. So my suggestion when designing types which you expose to QML is to make, them, to make as many properties as you can. Properties make it very binding friendly in QML. Um, you should use the notify attribute to queue property, as you can see in the code snippet there. It says queue property, queue string text, read text, write set text, notify text changed. So essentially, when the C++ decides that the text property has changed, it emits the signal text changed. When text change is emitted, QML figures out that, OK, fine, text has changed, and it will update its bindings. Often you have properties which are constant, uh, which don't change ever. Um, for these properties which are constant, it feels silly to have a notify signal. So you will drop the whole notify stuff. But as soon as you drop notify, you will find that QML runtime will complain you are trying to bind to a non-notifiable property. So to avoid that error, what you need to do is to use the constant attribute. Uh, constant allows, also allows QML to cache this attribute's value. You can also use the final attribute to mark a C++ property as final, uh, meaning that you cannot override it in QML. Uh, for example, x, y, width, height properties of item element are marked as final. So you cannot have your own property called x, y, width, height in QML. If you look at how QML code is structured, we have a top-level item. And inside the top-level item, you have these children. What exactly is happening in the background? All child items actually get magically assigned to a property called the default property. So if you have a rectangle inside item, rectangle gets assigned as the default property of item, and the default property of item is actually children, which is how you get child elements inside QML magically. If you want your own default property, if you want all your child elements to get automatically assigned to something else other than children, you can use uh, this magic snippet of code, Q class info default property property. Uh, you can also register C++ enumerations uh, to be used from QML using Q enums. There are cases where you need to register enumerations, but you don't want the type itself to be instantiable. For this, you can use a function called QML register uncreatable type. QML also has a nice syntax for property groups. Um, if you see the syntax for anchors, for example, you have anchors.top, anchors.bottom. If you look in the C++ side, anchors is really just a C++ object. And the anchors object has properties called top, left, right, bottom. And you can do this too. So if you had a my button class which has a lot of style-related properties, let's say like color, frame, width, and shadow, the my button class can return a style object. And the style object has these different properties. And in the QML, you can use this nice syntax. You can say style, curly brace, assignment to the properties. If you don't use group properties, it's mostly just syntactical annoyance. Uh, I mean, you will have to say style color colon red, style frame width colon three. It's just hard to use. Uh, one pitfall you need to know, you need to be aware of, is that if you have multiple signals of the same name in C++, QML cannot connect to both of them. QML can connect only to the last defined C++ signal. Um, it is just the way it is. Uh, th so the way to go about this is to essentially rename it to something else. 
You should also avoid Q variant properties. Uh, QML is a uh, type safe language, uh, so you get a performance benefit for letting QML know that my properties are of a certain type. If you know that your type is of type string, say it's a Q string property, if it's rect, Q rect, color, Q color. If you use Q variant properties, the QML engine tries to do a lot of magic conversion uh, from strings and other types into a Q variant, and that code path is really slow. Uh, so you should try to avoid having Q variant properties. In QML, you can have Q string list models, and you can also have, let's say, Q list of something. Uh, when you take these properties or Q invocables, you can assign them as models to a view, and everything works fine. But you need to be aware of the pitfall of this approach, which is essentially that if these lists change, QML has no idea of knowing that the list has actually changed. And the reason is Q string list and Q list are just normal primitive data types. They have no signals and slots. They are not Q objects. The way to notify QML that something has changed in a list is using this class called Q declarative list property. It has all these hooks, and the code you have to end up writing is quite ugly, but um, it's well documented, easy to do. So you should be aware that a changing list in C++ should always be Q declarative C list property. Now that you have lots of properties in C++, you are going to instantiate this uh, type in QML. Uh, so you would say in the QML, you would assign, let's say, 10, 15 properties. Now every time a property gets assigned, your C++ code is going to get called. And the C++ code now wants to do something. It wants to say, OK, the property has changed. Let me do something. So if you have like 10 properties in QML, you probably are going to do 10 things on startup. Right? So the way to avoid this is to inherit from something called Q declarative parser status. Uh, it is a C++ interface. If you inherit from Q declarative parser status, uh, you get a virtual method called component complete. In component complete, you can do your one-time in initialization. At that point, all the QML properties have been assigned in C++, and you do your actual construction in component complete. One of my favorite classes in QML is Q declarative property map. Uh, like I said, you should avoid uh, usage of context properties. But if you do use context properties, let's say you have an object, C++ object, if you remember from this slide here. We access it as person.name in the QML, but it is not immediately obvious. What is person? Where did person come from? Because in the QML code, there is no mention of person anywhere, right? How exactly? So what you can do with the Q declarative property map is that you can take this person object. Let's see. Yeah. You can take the person object. You can put it inside Q declarative property map. You can give this Q declarative property map a name. And the name I usually use is runtime. And I take the Q declarative property map and register it with the QML engine. And now I would do runtime.person.name instead of just person.name. So in the QML side, whenever you see runtime dot, you know, ah, this is something which is coming from the C++. That pretty much um, sums up my C++ side tips. Does anybody have any questions? I know the information is fairly dense. <laughs> But there's a lot of uh, stuff I wanted to cover. Is, any questions? No? OK. So let's go to the layer above, which is essentially QML. There's no real tips I can provide with QML other than the fact that you should think as declaratively as possible, and you should use states and transitions. And really, this is just practice. There's nothing I can say to force you to think declaratively. Quite often, when designing QML, people tend to forget all the hard-learned C++ lessons, data encapsulation, data hiding. If you look at the screen, uh, that is actually the XBMC screen. We have a list view on the left. 
we have a header which shows the weather and the time information on the top. And below, we have these control buttons. I have seen QMLs where they would look at the screen and they would write this huge QML file where everything, where the entire screen is, is implemented in one file. Instead, what you should do is you should start thinking of things as components, just like you would do in C++. You would take the list view on the left. You would make it a separate file called, let's say, rootmenu.qml. You would take the weather information on the top. You would make it a separate QML called header.qml. You take the control buttons at the, at the bottom. You call it control buttons.qml. And after that, to design the main screen, you create a separate QML file called main screen.qml. Main screen.qml essentially instantiates these three components and it positions them appropriately. The other thing is that when window, for example, let's say you select the movies item in the QML, it, is, it should not be the root menu's responsibility to actually show a window and such. Instead, what you should do in main screen.qml is to connect to the activated signal of root menu and then show the screen. So the logic is actually in the main screen. This is basically what you would do in C++. So follow the same things in the QML world. This is actually a suggested approach in the QML documentation. Um, you should try to arrange your QML code um, in the following order. First, you list down the ID of the element. Then you have the property declarations the signal declarations, the JavaScript functions, object properties, uh, which are essentially the properties inherited from the parent. Uh, you list down your child elements. Uh, then you have the states and transitions. The main reason why it is ordered this way is that you, each component list is public API upfront. So the property declaration, signals, and JavaScript are essentially the public API of any component. And the rest is just implementation. QML has a concept called dynamic scoping. Each component has a scope associated with it. The scope of a component is essentially the ID of all the elements in that component and the top level item properties. When a component instantiates another component, it forms what is called the scope chain. And it so happens that child components can actually access parent components scope. So if you see the example evil code here, if you, you ha we have a parent.qml on the left. Um, it has a property called duration. And it has a child element. In child.qml, if you see the interval property, you can actually access p.duration, even though, and this is because we have two component scopes. One is parent and one is child. And the child is allowed to access the parent scope. In general, you should never, ever do this. The only reason to do this would be if parent and child are really the same QML file, and you have just split it up because the file was too big. And this is a case, for example, let's say list view and its delegate. The list view and the delegate are tightly coupled to each other. So it's OK in those cases. But in any other case, you should not be doing it this way. What you should do instead is child.qml should expose a property called interval. And the child's interval property should be set in parent.qml. If that wasn't convincing enough, I'm going to uh, put a nice quiz. So I have some code here. Uh, the code here is really simple. Um, there's a property color. Uh, it says from color is red. To color is blue. There's a gradient, which is my gradient. Uh, maybe. And then we have my gradient itself is another component. It's just a gradient. It just has two gradient stops. Um, I think from the code here, it should be fairly obvious that um, from color is green, to color is red. So you're going to have a red rectangle which goes from red to green. So fairly straightforward, everything is OK. But let's say at some point you decide, you know what, I'm going to merge these two components. 
Uh, give me a sec. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the gradient code. and put it straight inside. So it's the equivalent, right? It's the same thing. And I'm going to run this, if I manage to save it. Yeah? So we expect a gradient from green to red. Wow. But it's not. It's not green to red. And it will actually pick up the properties from the parent, from red, red and blue. And to be honest, this is extremely hard to understand why. Unless you go into the details of QML and component scopes and things like that. And I'm not going to try explaining that. My suggestion to work around the whole thing is whenever you write, whenever you access properties which are not properties of the same element. So for example, you see from color here. From color is not a property of gradient stop. It is a property of gradient. So always qualify the axis. So always say gradient. Yeah, and if you do this, you will get yeah the green to red as before. If you are interested to know why it is the way it is, yeah, just feel free to grab me after the talk. So like I said, always qualify property axis of elements which are not in the same. Uh, scope uh, with the ID. You should also be careful of what you import in the QML file. If you import modules which are uh, not used, so let's say if you import Qt WebKit 1.0, but you never use WebView in your component, QML will load the WebKit plugin anyway. And that's the way it is, so you should always avoid it. You, in QML, you can connect to properties using the onProperty chain slot. You should be aware that onProperty chain is actually not called when the component is created. So if you have with colon 100, and if you have on with changed some code, on with change code is not called on startup. If you want to have code which needs to run at startup, you should put it in component.onCompleted. This is essentially the C++ equivalent of queue declarative parser status uncompleted. Like I said before, try avoiding making of these large QML files. The same logic here. Don't copy-paste stuff. As soon as you see that you have something very, you are copying the same code over and over again, try to make it a component, a separate QML file. Try to keep your components as simple as possible. One of the things which we made a mistake initially in Media Hub is to try to do too much, try to make the components too generic. We had this button, we had this button which can display images, text, it was checkable, it could be a radio button, it could be exclusive. We have all sorts of crap and it, it was extremely hard to read. Instead, make your components very simple. For example, checkable button, image button, text button, it does only one thing. It is highly unlikely that you want to mix all these features in a single thing anyway. It's not like these things are uh, determined at runtime. When creating your own QML components, you can use the dpointer approach just like you would in C++ to hide all the internal variables. So here we have something called click cost focus. It is an internal property to line edit. Uh, what you can do is you can create something called a cute object, and you can put all your properties inside that. If you want to access this property now in line edit, you can just say d dot click cost focus. This basically prevents the users of your line edit class from accessing click cost focus because it's an internal variable. When you design components, when you, when you want it to be reused by others, others want to use the states and prop, uh, states and transitions variable. Now, if your own component code was using the states and transitions variable, there's going to be a conflict. So the general suggestion is don't use the states and transitions variable when you are designing components. The states, instead of 
using the states and transitions variable, you can use what is called the state group. State group essentially is just a collection of states and transitions, and you can even have multiple state groups in the same component. So by freeing up these two properties, the user of your component can use them now. So there are other tips, implicit width and implicit height. Back in Qt Quick 1.0, um, we have the width and height property, right? If you want to find the width and height, let's say, of an image element or the width and height of the text element, you would use the width and height property. But at the same time, the width and height property is what is used to actually size the elements. So what happens is you lose information here. You lose the intrinsic width and height of an element. In Qt Quick 1.1, you have two properties, two new properties called implicit width and implicit height, using which you can find the intrinsic width and height of an item. When building composite components, composite components are where you compose multiple QML items together. If you want to know the bounding rect of all these child components, you can use children rect property. It is a part of item. And just like in the C++ side, you could use the Q-class info trick, which are, where you specify a default property. On the QML side, there is actually something called the default keyword. You can also get a lot of ideas by reading the Qt components project to design your own components. So the URL is right there. So the other side of QML is the JavaScript stuff. If the same JavaScript file is imported by multiple QMLs, each QML gets a copy of the JavaScript library. If you know, for example, beforehand that your JavaScript library doesn't really have a state, it, let's say it's like a math library or something, what you can do is you can add this line called dot pragma library. And when you add dot pragma library, this is like a shared JavaScript code. And there will be exactly one instance of JavaScript which will be shared between multiple QML files. There are downsides to making your, to making your JavaScript a dot .pragma library. The first thing is you cannot actually have public variables. Um, you cannot use this as a mechanism of sharing data between multiple QML components. You also cannot access QML items from JavaScript. And these are the two pitfalls you need to be aware of. You can use Qt.include to include other JavaScript files into uh, your current JavaScript. Another thing you need to remember is that when you have global code in JavaScript, QML does not have, the JavaScript does not have access to the QML yet. Think of it as your QML file says import foo.js. Foo.js is being loaded. When it loads, the global code is run. The global code is var x equal to QML item dot foo, but the item is still being constructed, right? So it doesn't have access to QML stuff. Global code in JavaScript does not have access to QML. The way to fix it is to have a callback into the JavaScript from the QML. Let's say in component dot on completed of QML, you say JavaScript dot initialize or something. This is a fairly common problem uh, which a lot of the QML user interfaces have. In Qt Media Hub, we have, this, we have lots of these skins, right? And each skin wants to show model data in a different way. So we have the Delphine skin, which wants to show the list of pictures in a single flat list. We have the Confluence skin, which actually wants to display information hierarchically. It wants to show where the picture was taken. So let's say it would say Paris. Belgium, whatever, and then you go into the folder, you see the actual pictures. And some other skin might want to have a completely different structure. So how do you solve this problem with the whole QML and C++ segregation? The views need some way of influencing the model. The way we solve this in Qt Media Hub is to have a C++ abstract item model called media model, and the QML skins the UI can actually configure the models uh, with the structure information. 
So here it says that the structure is artist, album, and song. What this would do is the model would rearrange itself so that first it would show the artist information, list of all artists. If you go inside each artist, it shows the albums of that artist. If you go inside the albums, it shows the song. So this is the general trick to use to have different layout of items for your model. I put this slide in this trick in because it's a very commonly asked question on IRC. The question essentially is, how can we access the model data associated with the delegate? You have a delegate. It has some model data associated with it. How do I access it from outside the, dele outside the delegate? The trick to know is each delegate is a component. So as I said, when components are created, it has a scope associated with it. Along with each scope for the delegate, there is a property called model. This, pro this context property is called model. You can actually expose this model property using this trick, property alias model data colon model. If you do that, you can access the model information associated with the delegate. Let's say, like below, it says list view on current index changed, current item, model data, name. So this gives you the name role associated with that delegate. Yeah, you probably have already been to all the graphics performance talks, so I'm not going to talk about this much. The main thing to remember is that Q declarative view, at the end of the day, is just a Q graphics view. Q graphics view is just an abstract scroll area. And abstract scroll area is just a widget, which has a viewport inside it. So all the tricks which you know to optimize this is going to be applicable even to Q declarative view. If you want OpenGL rendering, just set an OpenGL viewport. Just simple stuff. And there are these magic attributes, which you can look up in the documentation. But the main reason I've listed them here is that it is entirely possible for you to create QML, which is transparent, where you can see the layers below. So if you had been to one of to our Qt booth, where we have Media Hub running in many devices, you would have seen that we have video rendering in a separate layer, and we have the QML in a separate layer. And the video actually shines through the QML. So you can see the QML UI rendering on top of the video. right? And they are actually being rendered as separate layers. So all this is possible. Unfortunately, a lot of these things are just trial and error. A lot of these things are platform specific. They are windowing system specific. Uh, I would suggest that you look into the Qt Media Hub code, or you can talk to me. I can tell you some of the tricks. But it's entirely possible, uh, just hard work. Getting Qt Media Hub running on a lot of targets, what we learned is that you should make your UI as image friendly as possible, use everything as Pixmap because they are readily acceleratable today. Uh, you can control the size of the image which QML loads into memory using the source size property. So if you have these humongous images, but you really only have use for a small image, set the source size to be the small size. Just like QPixmap cache, QML has its own image cache. Unfortunately, this image cache size is not configurable. So if you want to cache the size, I mean, if you want to provide a size for this, there is no public API for it. You have to make the modification to Qt yourself. Um, there is an open bug for it. So if you care, you should yeah, vote on it. There's a lot of other stuff I wanted to cover, but um, we are running out of time. So I'll give you a brief. Um, or idea into what we have been researching into. Uh, in QML, in Qt Media Hub, we wanted to have downloadable skins. We wanted the user to be able to download QML files and run it locally. Um, we were looking into various approaches by which QML can be bundled as a tarball or something. Um, there are already solutions out there. One is the QAR file approach, uh, which is part of the QML Arsenal project. Uh, the one downfall of this approach is that it uses Q abstract file engine. If you know how Q abstract file engine works, it injects special file handling mechanism throughout Qt and not just to QML. So what this means is that if you have QAR files listed in your um, dialogs, uh, they will behave differently. 
the file dialogs, they will start behaving differently because you injected some file engine stuff uh, to entire queue. The approach we are using instead is using a custom queue network access manager, uh, where we see that if it is, we have a special scheme called QAR. Uh, when we see that it's a special scheme, we create a custom queue network reply object and use that. Uh, Qt Media Hub also actually supports apps. Uh, there is a requirement that we download random QML applications and run it locally. Uh, the main problem we have at this point is that, like I said, they form, a they form a scope chain, right? So it is entirely possible for your app, for this random app which you downloaded from the web, to access uh, the top-level properties. So they can mingle with the states, transitions, set random properties, uh, which is bad. Uh, ideally, we should try to somehow sandbox uh, this application. Uh, there is no real solution yet, but a couple of days back, there was a mail on the Qt QML mailing list suggesting a sandbox loader, which essentially creates a new queue declarative engine. So you have two queue declarative engines in the same graphics view. Uh, it, has a, it has some pitfalls. Um, I actually replied to the mail, so if you're interested, uh, you can look into that. There's resolution-independent user interfaces. We wanted to have Qt Media Hub run on a variety of resolutions. Uh, so far, the only thing we have is that we wanted to have a single code base and target multiple resolutions. What we do today is the top-level QML occupies the full screen. All the child elements are essentially a percentage of the main width. So if you remember the XBMC screen where we had a list view on the left side, the list view would say, my width is 30% of the parent width. So it's all percentage page. Uh, that approach works fairly well for us, but I can imagine that this won't work in many situations. Uh, and the only way I know of to do this is by forking your QML and providing a separate QML for each resolution. The last topic, which is there, but I don't want to talk about, is keyboard focus. If you have dealt with focus handling in QML. All I wanted to say is that it is extremely hard to get QML focus handling right. Uh, the fact is that the code, Qt Quick, as of today, is primarily meant for touch interfaces. Uh, and the keyboard handling, at least to me, appears to be more like an afterthought. Uh, it's really hard to get keyboard focus handling right. Um, we have a lot of, and our Qt Media Hub project primarily relies on focus handling because it's going to run on TVs and stuff. Uh, we have a lot of hacks. We just have it working. If you want to know them, again, get me after this talk. And that's it. Thank you. Do you have questions? Hello. Yeah? Some of our <coughs> applications have lists like Excel. How can I do this? This was QML. Uh, list like Excel, you mean? So like a table? OK, tables are entirely possible in QML, actually. Um, you can just use a simple list view. And uh, the list view has a delegate. And the delegate just has multiple columns. Would that work? Incidentally, what I actually just implemented a table for one of my friends. So maybe if you want to look at the code, I can show you. What I did, yeah. I have. I have a few questions. Yeah. Uh, first one is regarding uh, components. Uh -huh. So you suggested uh, writing the components in C plus plus and then exposing them to QML. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I have a button component, mm -hmm. so the backend should be in C plus plus and the UI should be in the QML file. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, what do so I? So for the general UI stuff, put it in the QML. The only reason you should have UI elements in C++ is simply because it's missing or something. Um, so for example, I mean, button was probably a bad example. You can entirely create a button.qml in QML, right? You don't need the help of C++. But let's say you have like visualization stuff like graphs and all that. It's not possible in QML. So you have to create it as a type in C++. Uh, with JSON DB, uh, the model comes into QML straight away. 
so then how do what what should we do uh, how do you propose what should c++ do with the data handling with uh come again with json db you can straight away access data okay, okay. in qml yeah so then c++ backend is not required at the yeah thing. that is true even for cases like the xml list model where you can get the data directly right i mean if that approach works for you it's fine but if you ever wanted to have another user interface the other user interface is going to basically copy this exact same code so you should just be aware of this yeah and uh, the third thing is uh, regarding mouse events now the problem is uh, what i have faced is if i have two layers so one component above the other mm -hmm. so the first component receives mouse events and it does not propagate to the second one have you ever faced this problem let's say you drag a comp drag a component and you right click at that point of time so the mm -hmm. first component loses the mouse focus completely and it it's, it it doesn't propagate it's it's great have okay. you ever faced problems with mouse events uh no not really because we don't really have drag and drop as part of our ui um no not just drag and drop uh, generally mouse events do not propagate so the problem is that uh, if i have so to basically what happens at least in graphics view which i guess is the idea in qml2 is that once an item gets the first mouse event it becomes the mouse grabber so all future events from the mouse go to the mouse grabber so it won't propagate to the thing below because you have accepted the first mouse button that is by design i think which creates other problems <laughs> because yeah. if you have layers of components then uh you would typically want the comp uh, the mouse event to propagate till somebody says okay i i consume the event I yeah mm -hmm. maybe i, I oh, okay i also had a similar problem before okay. and in qml what you usually do is you um make a mouse uh, um this mouse handling component on top of or everything in principle mm -hmm. and that one is then handling all the mouse events for everything it's ugly to do because you need to know exactly what is going on below but uh, yeah that's the only way that i found out and the same in thing is in principle when you have things like uh, or want to implement like mouse gestures and then there need to be one single component handling this mouse gestures because there could be several of them of course so you need to have one component handling everything knowing all the status and that would be some yeah kind of mouse event handler on top of everything then that becomes pretty much specific towards the ui that you're implementing for each screen yeah it's or, or you can create an item in c++ which can have some magic properties which give you this behavior right i i think that's actually a good idea yeah to have it. in principle what i think is if you have a little bit more logic then more logic means if it goes beyond one page of javascript code then that should be a c++ plugin that's fairly simple to do and you have all the benefits of c++ with static typing and stuff like that so yeah do a plugin okay what i did was i had every component have a signal <laughs> which would emit but that that's kind of ugly because it just propagates yeah any other questions done done okay thank you have a nice evening